Hey guys, I decided to make a video on not necessarily the implementation of heart murmurs, but more or less how you can change heart murmur intensity by various maneuvers that a doctor may do in a clinical setting. So let's get right into this. I'm going to draw out a very, very simple, uh, let's say, setting for a heart. Okay? So this is as if you're the patient laying down in the doctor's office. And so the left side is going to be this side because you have to imagine you're looking through the eyes of the patient or looking at the patient. So this is the left atrium. This is the left ventricle. This is the right atrium. And then this is the right ventricle. Now, you can have various murmurs at different parts, at different parts of the heart. And you can have systolic murmurs, and then you can also have diastolic murmurs. Okay? And so the way that I remember which ones are systolic and which ones are diastolic is I do this. I draw out a quick little model of a heart, a little square model of a heart, and I basically ask myself, what's happening? So, if, so for example, if the question were to tell you, you have a systolic murmur, before you read any of the other details that the question is giving, like the how the type of murmur sounds on auscultation, where it's radiating, and any of that stuff, just the fact that they're telling you it's a systolic murmur, I know that I can eliminate all of the murmurs that are diastolic, and then if any of the answer choices are referring to diastolic murmurs, whether it be characteristics or the actual diastolic murmur itself, I can go ahead and eliminate those right away. So right away, how do you memorize which ones are systolic and which ones are diastolic? So if the question tells you it's a systolic murmur, I go ahead and draw out a diagram of a heart of, and then I go to the left ventricle because that's where everything concerning systolic and uh, systole, uh, systole and diastole, uh, diastole is happening primarily. I mean, obviously, it's happening over in the uh, right ventricle as well, but every, usually what we're concerned with is the left ventricle. So in systole, what happens is this valve is closed, and then this valve, which is the aortic valve, is opened, right? Because in systole, you're sending blood out to the systemic part of the body. So this left ventricle has to contract. So this will go in, this will contract, and if this was open here, this uh, valve, which just happens to be called the mitral valve, if that was open, you would send blood backwards in the heart. But in systole, we know that you're sending blood forwards. Okay, so that's the first thing I do. I draw out, so now let's go to a clean diagram here. This is a square here of the heart. And in systole, this is closed and this is open. Now, the way I tackle murmurs is a murmur, as far as a systolic murmur, is anything that would pretty much alter this basic setup of systole. For example, in systole, we know that the mitral valve has to be closed. So then you could imagine a murmur that would affect systole would be something that would mess up this to stop it from being closed, like mitral regurgitation. That would kind of force this to be slightly open and then blood flow would go backwards. So that's a example of a systolic murmur. Now, another murmur in systole is if you alter this valve. So this is the aortic valve. This should be opened in systole to send blood out to the rest of the body. So a way that a murmur could happen here is if it was something that was stopping it from being opened, like aortic stenosis. Okay, so those are that's the way you can figure out some the murmurs of systole and diastole. Now, of course, if you have mitral regurgitation, you know, then you go, the same thing that's happening on the left side of the heart is also happening on the right side of the heart. So with mitral regurgitation, the same thing that could happen and set up this scenario would also be tricuspid regurgitation. Because remember, the tricuspid valve is over here. And in systole, it's doing the same thing. Just as this aortic valve is opened, sending blood out into systemics, this tricuspid valve is closed, and then the pulmonic valve would be open on the right side of the heart. So that's how you know, that's how you can figure out what specific situations would cause a systolic versus a diastolic murmur. Same thing here. You have aortic stenosis, right? Well, we know uh, not only would could the aorta be a stenosis, but you could have pulmonic stenosis because it's the same thing could be happening on the right side as the left. So how does this work for diastolic? Well, same exact principle. Here's our basic example. 
And in diastole, this is the filling of the left side of the heart, or, or also the filling of the right side as well, but we always usually draw it out in the left side. So in diastole, to be able to fill the left ventricle specifically, this has to be open because remember, blood's coming from the left atria, entering into the left ventricle. And then this has to be closed. Say this is the aortic valve. That must be closed because if this was open, then blood would just go you know, out into systemic circulation and you wouldn't be filling up the heart. That would be the definition of systole. So let's go to a clean version again. Diastole is just this being opened, so which is the mitral valve being opened and the aortic valve closed. You could, you could do the same thing that we're saying for the left side as the right side. So for the right side, that means that the tricuspid valve must be open and the pulmonic valve must be closed, right? So once we know that this is the correct what's supposed to be happening diastole, a murmur will alter the basic setup. So a murmur will say, okay, if this is open allowing blood into to fill the left ventricle, what situation could happen that would stop that from happening would be abnormal causing a murmur during diastole? Well, now in this situation, it would be mitral stenosis. Okay, and whatever's happening on the left side, it can be mirrored on the right side. So mitral stenosis or tricuspid stenosis. And then same thing, let's go to the other valve. Well, if diastole, in diastole, if the aortic valve has to be closed, that means what kind of problematic situation could happen where the aorta was open during diastole, messing up the situation of diastole? That would be aortic regurgitation. It's allowing some blood back in. It basically, it's not closing all the way, and, and blood is re being regurgitated back through it, and that will, alter the, uh, that will alter diastole. So, just as you could say aortic regurgitation, you could say on the other side, pulmonic, the pulmonic valve should be closed during diastole, but what kind of situation would allow it, would cause it to be open? What pathological situation? That's going to be pulmonic regurgitation. That's the way, so I don't memorize like a, like a list, okay, these are the four, you know, like I don't memorize what are the four systolic murmurs. This is the way that I do it. I draw out the little picture and I say the two things that could be wrong from the normal situation. So that's the way that I memorize this. All right, so that's kind of going in a little bit too much detail. Um, I, I expect that you've studied a little bit on some of that part of it. But this video is going to cover looking at the maneuvers that affect those various um, murmurs. For example, here's a patient's heart, okay? And the, let's just say, I mean, it doesn't even matter. I'm just going to put it here. Let's say this patient has mitral stenosis, okay? So in other words, mitral stenosis would cause a problem when you're trying to open this up. So normally, when you're trying to send blood through the mitral valve from the left atrium to the left ventricle would be during what would be during diastole, right? So if this is stenosed, that would cause a problem with this being opened up, right? So where it should be fully open up and allowing blood through a stenosed mitral valve would cause a problem with that. So this is a diastolic. We're referring in this situation, this is a diastolic murmur. And this is, I just picked this out at, at random. So we have this diastolic murmur, and this mitral valve is having mitral stenosis. Now, here's some different scenarios. I'm going to give you the list that's really important. Inspiration. Okay, that's the first one. Valsalva. The next one is abrupt standing. or standing up really fast, um, squatting, or just squat, uh, passive leg raise, or the leg raise, and then you have hand grip. Okay, so let's t look at the first one, inspiration. In the case of inspiration, when you inspire or when you take breath in with your lungs, you say, imagine we're looking at the side, a man. Sorry, I'm really bad at drawing. This is our guy, right? Here's his arms kind of down by his side. Okay, this is him just basically at rest before the inspiration happens. So this is like right after expiration occurred. And he's about to take in a deep breath. So this is this distance here. 
going from like his left arm to his right arm, you know, is his total distance, let's say of his chest, the, the, the length across from one arm to the other, like his chest distance. And that is a given distance, right? So to say this is X, whatever it may be, X inches across from arm to arm. He, if he were to take in, inspire air and fill up as much as he could, that means that this distance has to hold more air so it would, it would like funnel out, you know? Like his chest is going to expand to hold all of that air. So you should know that when you make a space bigger, like for example, the lungs are up here at the top, right? This is the area of the lungs. And then of course you have the heart here and then your, ab your abdominal area here. If you expand this area, there's a decrease in pressure, right? And anytime there's a decrease in pressure, it's easier for stuff to move into that area. Okay? So, let's now, in relation to the heart. Here's our heart that we drew out right here. And this patient has mitral stenosis. And this is going to cause problems when blood is trying to fill up in the left, uh, going from the left atrium to the left ventricle. Of course, the amount of blood that's in the heart would definitely affect the situation of mitral stenosis. So, we look at our situation, inspiration. When you inspire and you take a deep breath, you're expanding the chest cavity, so you're lowering the pressure in the chest. But here's where it gets kind of weird for the example of inspiration. Not, are, not only are you lowering the pressure in the chest, but you have to imagine you're, low, you're expanding not only the chest, but the lung space as well. So what's going to happen from inspiring? Well, blood from your venous system will much easily rush up to the heart because now there's less pressure. So all of, so say this is our patient right here, and this is their heart, and then down here is their leg, the lower body, and then here's their arms, right, out here. All of this, all of this extra blood that's in the venous system is going to come rushing back into the heart, into the, you know, going, starting from the right atrium, and then it'll go through the rest of the heart. So, inspiration will cause increased blood to uh, go back to the heart. Increased blood back to heart. Now, you would think, oh, okay, well, increased blood back to the heart would mean that there's more blood, and that will intensify the murmur going across any of the parts of the heart. Well, that's not necessarily true. Because, I, remember, I said that in inspiration the lungs itself are expanding. So even though you'll have increased blood flow to this part of the heart, it is true, they're going to increase blood flow to going back to the heart, to the right part of the heart. The reason that you don't get an increased blood flow back to the left side of the heart is because the lungs have expanded. So if this area gets bigger up here, that means that all this blood that, that would be coming from the lungs into the left atrium and then would eventually go to the left ventricle, all that blood now, it's a lower pressure up here as well from the inspiration, the effective. So this blood will rush out. So there's, so in essence, there's less blood in here now. So there's, okay, so let me clean up. This is kind of messy. I'm just trying to really get this point to you. So let's draw this again. We have said that there now is all this blood that has rushed back to the lungs because there's decreased pressure. Well, where's that blood coming from? It's coming from here. This area has increased blood, but this area has lost a lot of its blood because it went back to the lungs when the lungs expanded its area as well. So there's decreased blood on the left side of the heart and there's increased blood on the right side of the heart there's also increased blood in the lungs. And the increased blood from the lungs came from the left side of the heart. It lost its... So what am I trying to say? What I'm trying to get at is almost all murmurs, almost all, I'm, I'm going to give you the two primary examples that this doesn't follow. Almost all murmurs increase in intensity. Increase in intensity with increased blood flowing across its valvular area. For example, in mitral stenosis, so the mitral valve is right here, and it's stenosed. So the more blood that goes across the stenosed uh, valve, sorry, I don't, I don't know why I drew this. It's good. Stenos, it's good. You know, blood's going from the left atrium to the left ventricle across a stenos valve. So when blood is coming across that stenos valve, 
the more blood that does it, the louder the murmur gets. So in mitral stenosis, you will have an increased murmur intensity or the loudness of the murmur will increase in the situation that there's more blood in the in the left side of the heart. But I just got done telling you in inspiration, the left side of the heart has a decreased blood. So that means in the case of mitral stenosis, you have a decreased sound or decreased loudness of the murmur in inspiration. Okay, but anything on the right side of the heart, let's say we were dealing with tricuspid stenosis. In tricuspid stenosis, this murmur would increase in the situation of inspiration because we have increased blood here. So, you know, and it doesn't matter whether I'm talking about stenosis or regurgitation. Both of them will increase in the case of increased blood flowing across that valve. But in the case of inspiration, we're losing, we don't have as much blood in the left side of the heart. So all of those murmurs, whether it be aortic stenosis, aortic regurgitation, mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation, all of the murmurs that are on the left side of the heart will decrease in the case of inspiration, except for two, one, two that I'm going to mention later. Okay, so that's the first one. So... I said all that kind of went on a tangent. I apologize about that. We were talking about inspiration. What you, what you need to know, in inspiration, you're sending, so it's increased blood back to right, back to the right side of heart. And, and the remember, now this is the important part, it's decreased blood in left side. And it's decreased blood in the left side because the lungs itself, from the inspiration, the lung space has expanded. So it's pulled that blood that normally would be going to the left atrium. It's pulled a lot of that out of the left atrium. Therefore, we have decreased left atrium blood and therefore decreased left ventricle blood. So the murmurs decrease from the left side of the heart. So with inspiration, what do we have? Let's just, just thinking of that concept, that means all murmurs on the right side of the heart will increase. So let's think of all the murmurs that you can have on the right side of the heart. You can have tricuspid stenosis. You can have tricuspid regurgitation. You can have pulmonic stenosis. You can have pulmonic regurgitation. All of these increase because you've increased the blood going to the right side of the heart. But which ones are going to decrease? The ones on the left side of the heart. So let's think of the valves on the left side. You have the mitral valve and the aortic valve, right? So the if you had mitral stenosis... If you had, you know, mitral regurgitation, if you had aortic stenosis, if you had aortic regurgitation, these murmurs are going to decrease, okay? Whatever the murmur may be, whatever, you know, whether it's a crescendo, decrescendo, which is a specific type of murmurs, you know, whether you have a mid-diastolic mid rumble or whatever, whatever the description of the murmur and what the murmur is, the imp we're just more addressing the maneuvers now about that. So those are going to decrease. And then I told you there's two weird exceptions. And the two weird exceptions is mitral valve prolapse and then hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. In mitral valve prolapse, the mitral valve actually balloons out back into the left atrium. Okay? So in other words, here's our heart. Okay? the mitral valve is going to kind of balloon backwards. Now, for kind of complex reasons, there's no point to get into a lot of the complex details of the reasoning why, but just remember these two because these two are the weird exceptions. In the case of mitral valve prolapse and hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, which both of these are, are diseases of the left side of the heart, in hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, that's primarily affecting the left ventricle. And then in mitral valve prolapse, well, you know the mitral valve is on the left side of the heart. So both of these are left heart-sided diseases. Whenever you have a decreased blood volume in that part of the heart, and we're referring to the left side of the heart, whenever you have a decreased blood volume, instead of you expecting that the murmur would decrease, like in the general rule I've been telling you, actually, these murmurs will increase in intensity. So... Let's go to, let, now let's relate this 